Hello, mi gente. It is Tori Indeed, and I have our special guest, Louis K. Meisel, credited for inventing the genre art term and movement titled photorealism in the 1960s, about, what, 1969? 69, yeah. Yes, yeah, awesome. And you are the owner of Louis K. Meisel Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. And you've authored and uh, published over 25 books. I'd like to start off and ask you, where does your passion for art or your love for art, where is it rooted from? Well, okay. So <laughs> I, have, <laughs> um, I can start in the middle here for a moment. Uh, when I was four years old, I, was, I began training as a classical pianist. And I did that for about 10 years. Um, I do represent a lot of classical pianists now and uh, present a lot of concerts. However, when I was 14, a friend of mine said, let's go to the Museum of Modern Art for your birthday. That was September 4th, 1956. I said, what's the Museum of Modern Art? Uh, I had spent my life going to concerts at concert halls, Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, et cetera, every weekend. I had no idea what a museum was, and Larry takes me to the Museum of Modern Art. 1956, we walk in, and lo and behold, there's Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, Mark Rothko, et cetera. Now, here's somebody that didn't even know what a painting was or what art was, and you walk in, you see that, holy smokes. At any rate, in some way or another, it got my attention, it got my life. We started going back to the Museum of Modern Art, and by 1958, 59, I was 16, 17, then 18, and we discovered the uh, Cedar Bar in New York. And when we did that, we met and saw many of these artists. It's hard to believe that, oh, those artists, you can actually meet them. We did. So when I was probably 18, I met Stamos, who was one of the youngest of the abstract expressionists. Um, many years later, I ended up representing him till he died. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, I got to meet the pop artists. Uh, the abstract expressionists didn't quite like what the pop artists were doing because they were bringing uh, imagery back to painting and the abstract expressionists had eliminated that. At any rate, a little bit later, I met Andy Warhol, who I saw lots of. Uh, Tom Wesselman, who was a really good friend, uh, Roy Lichtenstein, and Mel Ramos. Uh, and Mel Ramos was the pop artist that eventually, when I had my gallery in Soho, I represented Mel, Mel Ramos until he died uh, about two years ago. At any rate, the pop artists had brought realism or imagery back, and they were, in fact, led by Rauschenberg, uh, Rivers, and Jasper Johns. Uh, they were the ones that were the link between abstract and pop. And I got to be good friends with Larry Rivers. And as a matter of fact, this year, there is a movie coming out that I am the producer of, which is called Bad Boy of the Art World, Larry Rivers. So anyway, getting back to those three groups, Stamos and Abstract, uh, I did work for Rothko also. Uh, then there was uh, Larry Rivers, The Link, and eventually Mel Romo's Pop. And now we get into the 60s, and there was a whole movement, we'll say, called New Realists. Uh, Tillam, Bruder, Alex Katz, Al Leslie, Philip Perlstein. Uh, these are all names of artists who were now uh, working in realism. But nothing distinguishable other than their individual take on things. In the mid uh, 60s, I met Malcolm Morley. And Malcolm Morley, some people say, was a forerunner of photorealism. And I actually have included him in my first book. Uh, but he was probably a late pop artist. And he didn't continue. What he was doing was actually making uh, images and paintings of uh, steamships, uh, ocean liners based on postcards, which was a photo. Towards the end of the 60s, I met or discovered or came across Richard Estes, Chuck Close, 
Audrey Flack, Ralph Goings, and Bob Bechtel. Um, they were artists that were using the camera as all artists had done since the camera was invented, but all other artists had generally denied it and said, oh no, we don't do that, that's cheating. We don't use the camera in the photograph. And, and this group of artists that I found said, of course we use it. That's how we gather the information to make the paintings we do. Richard Estes said, I'm not sitting out on the street looking up Broadway for six months doing drawings or trying to paint all the details. I can't do it. So take a lot of pictures. Um, in 1969, I had a show, let's say, first of all, in 1969, I opened my first gallery, which was at Madison and wow. 79th Street. Uh, on, uh, it was halfway between the Whitney and the Metropolitan, and it was on the street, not very big, but perfect location. And I opened a show with these artists and there were not um not too many of them and they didn't make big paintings so it was a pretty decent show and one of my art critic friends uh showed up and he said lou these paintings are terrific he says but the art world's going to hate it they're going to hate you it's going to tell you you're going backwards and he came up with all sorts of you know uh negative comments that he felt were going to come my way however <laughs> He said, what do you call these artists? I said, they're great realists. And no, he says, I need something better than that. And we started thinking, I said, well, you know, they're using the photograph. Uh, they, 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 they don't deny it. As a matter of fact, they brag about it. They've become great photographers. They know what they're doing. They explain how they use it and how, then, how they transfer the information from a projected slide or by using the old English grid method. Um, Photographic realism. I said, I don't know, maybe photorealism. And that weekend, he wrote an article and he said, Mizell Gallery is showing photorealism. That was the first time the word was used in the press. Um, three months later, four months later, it was the first show of the decade of the 70s. And the Whitney Museum, curated by Jim Monty, the curator, opened a show called 22 Realists. In preparing for that show, he had been to my gallery. Uh, some of these artists that we're talking about were in it. And um, he actually used the word photorealism in his uh, catalog. So not only had it been in the, in the newspaper, uh, now it was in a museum catalog and the word existed. In 1972, I was commissioned by a collector to create a terrific collection of photorealism, or to collect, he wanted a collection uh, of photographs of paintings. Um, I'm sorry, paintings of airplanes. I explained to him that there was this new group of artists, there were about 20 of them that I had designated or thought of that were doing this incredible work, uh, and that I'd ask them to make paintings, but I wouldn't tell them to make paintings of airplanes. I would simply tell them that your interest is aviation and let them do what they do because you want a classic painting by each one. And you, you, if with Richard Estes, for instance, who did storefronts, instead of telling him to do an airplane, what he actually did was a painting of the Alitalia uh, storefront on Fifth Avenue. And in it was a model airplane and so forth and so on. So I built an incredible collection, and part of the deal was that he let me travel it to 25 museums to promote this new genre or movement or whatever you want to call it. And he agreed to that, and that went to 25 museums uh, until 1978, and it was really a big boost. And then all sorts of European museums and collections picked up on the idea, and I would say that in the 70s, I was involved in at least 50 to 80 museum uh, shows where I provided the names of the actual paintings of, or, you know, assistants. Uh, that whole thing continued on to this day. There's been over 300 museum shows. There's one opening in Lyon, France, uh, last week that's going to Paris next week. Uh, and there are other things planned. So that's basically it. 
One of the problems with these painters is that they do one, two, or three paintings a year. And back in the 70s, all my art dealer friends said, Lou, <laughs> how are you going to make a living on an artist that does, you know, one, two, or three paintings a year? And today we have five or six mega galleries with uh, 200 employees and 15 or 20 locations and artists that have factories making 100 paintings a month. Uh, and that's where the art world is looking. Um, there's so few photoreals paintings that anybody can get that it's kind of left to me and I, I now have a monopoly. My friend art dealers that may have dealt in photorealism, they've died or they've retired or they've passed on. Uh, and I am here now with probably about a dozen of the original and new photorealists that are still producing. Uh, in the 21st century, we have what I call the uh, photorealists of the digital age. And it means yeah. that instead of, <laughs> instead, of a, instead of a camera with 24 or 36 shots to make slides, they can take thousands of digital pictures. Uh, if they take a picture of a city street, they can photograph the individual storefronts. They can go up and down the street, and then they can take all of this information, put it in their computers, Photoshop it, and come up with an image that they wish to paint. I'm going to step aside for a second. You can see one of the paintings by Bertrand Menil. Uh, i got to get out of the way. Of Chinatown. He, he paints city streets, and he's the, he's the most detailed of all the painters in photorealism today. Um, anyway, I think we will be providing pictures of other photorealist works um, as we go. That's the basic story. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to just appear for a moment. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for sharing your experience, for sharing that moment of time that has um, made a difference and marked a movement today. I really want to go over a few things that you mentioned. I know um, when the camera was invented, an artist, um, I would say, was it like a taboo for artists to use a camera and use it as a resource to be no. able to paint photorealism? Let me go back to that again, because that's an earlier part of the story. And when I do lectures, uh, I start with this sort of kidding around. I said the camera was invented in around 1850. But before that, going back to the caveman who recorded the hunt, artists were painting places, faces, and things, portrait, still life, landscape. They were reporters. They were recording world history, personal history, religious stories, etc. So now the camera comes along, and I'm kidding around. I say that there was a bunch of young artists sitting around in a cafe in Paris around the 70s, and it was Manet, Monet, Cezanne, Renoir. These artists were there, and uh, one of them said, hey, there's cameras here. We don't have to do that anymore. And the Impressionists began moving away with their Impressionist paintings. So the camera made it possible for art to move away from imagery. It went through post-impressionism. Then we had cubism with Picasso, Leger, and Brock. Uh, eventually, we got to surrealism into the 20s and 30s. And finally, it got to be abstract expressionism. Uh, those artists were influenced by the surrealists who came to America to get away from World War II. They came to New York. They went out to the Hamptons with Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko and Stamos and the rest of them. And imagery disappeared because the camera made it possible. And lo and behold, in the 60s, the camera made it possible for the most intense extreme realism that ever existed. And as we got into the 20th century, 21st, we now have uh, the finest, you know, I, the Manil that I showed you, I, I just got a painting, a photograph of a painting that's coming in next week of Las Vegas, which we will provide for you to see later on. And 
it is the most information packed, detailed painting that has ever existed on the face of the earth, anywhere, anytime, 5,000 years on earth. And no one can or will or will want to even dispute that statement upon seeing it. However, the painting right behind me is also just about on that same level. Uh, if you can see storefronts in those places, if it's a, uh, a meat store, you can see the salamis hanging in the window, so on and so forth. Well, now cameras and high resolutions, and I know they have the capability, the technology to zoom in to such details and show things that you didn't even expect to be in a painting. Right. I know earlier you mentioned the music, the compositions, and I actually was saving that as a fun fact. You also mentioned your upcoming film that you are the producer of. So I really thank you for sharing that with me. I just love how it just all came along naturally. You went to a museum and you just, from there, combined the two. I know there's um, Mizell Music that you also have. Yes, um, aside from the photorealist, actually, I have another major uh, uh, part of American art history that I show that's also not favored by the art world. Uh, I am the leading dealer, collector, and author on something that I call the Great American Pinup. And those are the paintings that were done as by illustrators for calendars, uh, for Playboy magazine, for Esquire starting in the 30s and running up through the 80s. And my book on that subject matter is The Great American Pinup. Yes. And it's got 900 pictures uh, by 72 artists. So that's another thing I've been doing. And then back in the 70s, there was an, a genre I called the abstract illusionists. And they were about 10 artists who were painting abstract paintings which is what, you know, it was the big thing. However, there was always an illusion of a third dimension, which was really quite strange. Um, paintings were perfectly flat. I'm going to try to show you one now, if I can. Oh, sure. This is, this is a painting by Stephen Posen. And number one, it's absolute realism. But number two... It's illusionism because it's perfectly flat. Uh, so it's abstract, it's illusionism, and it's real. Because right. what he did was he put up these things on a wall and then painted them. So that's an abstract painting, realism, it's everything else. And he, he was a great artist, um, but he made some mistakes back in the 70s uh, and he went on to something else. His son, by the way, is Zach Posen who a lot of people know is a very famous fashion designer. Wow. But that was another area. But somehow or other, the idea of illusionism, um, it, it was too commercial. Uh, the pinups, of course, that was a, an illustrator's uh, a segment of illustration. So people didn't consider it fine art. Right. And, and the photorealism, it's another story. There's a whole lot of stuff to talk about there. I know. I could talk to you forever. You definitely are part of history. You laid down the foundation of photorealism, invented the terminology for the genre itself. I know previously you also mentioned that it's about the beauty, the quality, the craftsmanship, and skill. A lot of it, it requires time, effort vision, uh, determination. Uh, it, there were very few artists that can actually do this or want to do it for lots of reasons. Uh, in 50 years, which is five decades, I have been happy enough to really find five artists a decade. Uh, and one of my books, the four books on photorealism, illustrate and document probably 95% of the 5,000 paintings by all the artists for 50 years. Uh, essentially, there are 25 artists that have made the cut. Uh, and if I do a fifth volume, which I'm thinking about, uh, I could call it those who made the cut. Um, 
And what I'm planning on doing is showing, since the last book came out in 2000, 20, 2010. So I would show 10 works by each of the top 25 artists who are still alive and painting or were in the last 10 years. Wow. Uh, but that's it. There's just, so I want to tell you that an entire movement or genre, there are only 5,000 paintings existing in the world. And Damien Hirst can do that and spin paintings in a year if he wanted to. It's kind of a two different worlds. Wow. And during your study and documentation, have you noticed perhaps uh, that every artist has their own set of techniques to interpret a picture into photorealism? Like, was that no, the that's, that's oh. actually a good question because when this got going in the 60s, there was no school anywhere teaching any artist how to make realism. Um, it was about theory, it was about ideas, it was about other things. So each of these artists has had to learn, develop, and come up with their own technique and way of making the art. And everyone has a different one. In my first book, there's actually a page showing a three inch square work by each of about 20 artists up close. And you can see it, I mean, some used airbrush, uh, some used regular brushes, uh, some used other instruments. Uh, John Salt, for instance, would cut stencils and spray through the stencils. Uh, Chuck Close uh, had a lot of different methods and ways of making his art. One of the most important things about Chuck Close is, uh, well, let me tell you this story. I went to a symposium once and it was called, What Will Chuck Close Paint Next? And before they got started, I raised my hand and the mediator said, oh, we'll have questions afterwards. And I said, well, I think what I have to say is important. So he made a mistake and let me speak. <laughs> and I said, the question should be, how will Chuck Close paint next? Not what, because he's not going to change from the faces for his entire career. But during his career, he came up with 50 different ways of making the faces with 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 all sorts of different methods and techniques, um, including photographs of different kinds and whatever. So anyway, again, getting back to what you said, all of the photorealists had to invent their own way of making the art. And then some, very few, actually would teach other artists. Charlie Bell was one of them. Uh, today, Yigal Oziri is one who runs a studio like an old master's studio where he has interns and assistants and they work for him and he teaches them. Um, anyway, that answers that question, I hope. Thank you so much. I, I find it very interesting that they have their own techniques, unique techniques or skills. And I guess that's part of also... A part of your description, you know, about the beauty, about the quality, the craftsmanship, the skills, like, you know, the combination of colors to create a mirror image or, um, you know, the airbrushing, the stencil. So everybody and each individual artist had their own method, but ultimately they were creating photorealism. Could we get into the three levels of the evolution of photorealism with the film, the 33 millim the 35 millimeter rather cameras, the true second generation artists. Well, and then I know you mentioned your book as well of the digital age. Uh, okay. Well, okay. First of all, Richard, Est Richard Estes had a 35 millimeter camera and he could either shoot 24 or 36 slides on a roll. And believe it or not, back in 19, 67 or 8 with not much money in his pocket uh, a roll of film was a lot of money so he went out there and he took a roll of film um, and he got the general idea of neighborhoods or street scenes or whatever and he went back and with that he was able to make the original cityscape paintings and from the middle of a room in a gallery when you look around from Estes to Manil to Penner to Niwek and to the rest of them, you get this photographic realist image. 
but if you walk up to an Estes, there is really no detail. It's an illusion, and he's brilliant at doing that. Uh, this was pretty much the case with much of the earliest artists. Um, then what I would have to call the second generation would be artists that came along in the 80s and had watched and had studied what the original 13 or 14 photorealists were doing and said, hey, I like that. I'm willing to put in the time. I can do that. I have imagery that interests me. And they still had pretty much the same cameras. But as we got into the 21st century, with the advent of the, uh, what you call, um, this camera, which the, everybody has. The, okay. the handheld uh, personal and assistant. <laughs> and they're better, these things are better than almost any of the cameras that any of the photorealists used back in the day. So, um, it's unlimited. It doesn't cost them anything to take a thousand pictures or more. Yogalo Ziri, right. who's, who's number one in painting beautiful people, primarily ladies and girls, will get started with somebody on the beach, out in the woods, in the city. And when people are getting photographed, they're a little bit nervous and uptight. So that if you only had a roll of 24 film, uh, it would be hard to really capture. He said to them, listen, let's just walk and talk. And for three hours, they can walk and talk. And he's just snapping pictures, bip, 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 and there's no sound of a camera. And after five minutes, he goes back to the studio and he starts running through them and with his assistants. And what do you think about this? What do you think about that? They'll get down to about 30 images, five of which he will probably paint. Um, if it's a commission, he'll show a dozen pictures to the person that wants their portrait or something, or have them as a model, and they'll pick whatever it is. But the bottom line is that when Manil does a, a, a painting like you saw behind me, he can actually photograph every storefront. He's got one of Times Square. And across Times Square, there's a camera store. And in the back of the camera store, through the window, you can see the cameras and the items on the glass shelves. And that came from several photographs. Uh, he can also take pictures up the avenue and across town and up to the tallest building. No camera can actually get all that. Uh, and the digital camera can. Um, I don't think that we can go anywhere beyond where they are now. It's incredible what the eye can capture versus what a lens can capture. The the digital details and tools that are available. I'm very observant, so I like to zoom in to pictures. And you can see the reflection in someone's glasses. And to see that in a painting, in a photorealism painting, it's just like, wow, you captured right. that. Yep. That's that it. reflection in someone's eyewear. You've done a good research on your own. You've asked a lot of good questions. Thank and you. you. Have a lot of things, you know, to uh, get me to talk about. It's an honor to speak with you and to talk to you because you are definitely part of history movement. You've you were able to categorize and set a genre for the artist. I call it a genre, and what's interesting right. is that all through history or our current or back history, artists made up the names of what they were to be called. The pop, the pop artists didn't. The abstract expressionists were the last. Uh, the word pop art was made up by an art critic, Lawrence Alloway. And the word photorealism was made up by an art dealer, me, not the artists. So before that, impressionism and all the rest were movements. Movements were made up by artists. The Impressionists were a movement, the Post-Impressionists, the Surrealists for sure, uh, and they had their names. But in more recent times, uh, their genres and names are made up by people, whether they're critics or dealers or, you know, whatever. Um, it's just things are strange and different nowadays. So I call it the genre of photorealism. 
Thank you so much for the clarification and, of course, the genre. I wanted to display your gallery. I have your website. There we go. So I'm here on your website and I am actually under the tab of artist and then all artists. Go to uh, Davis Cone, for instance, the theater next to the Chuck Close. Yeah, click on that. Okay, so wow. David. Radio so each one you'll have a picture, then below that it says works. Click on right. work. And he is known for painting theaters. So click on that right one. That happens to be a theater in Miami, the cameo. Right. So that's what it is. So Davis Cohn is known for painting theaters. Uh, okay, go back. There's another one. There's another one. All right, go back up to the page again, back. to artists. Okay, so let's go down. Uh, you'll see Estes, there it is to the left. Okay, so Estes Whoa. is number <laughs> one. He was the grandfather of photorealism in cityscape. And while he did a lot of just broad cityscapes, what was interesting and what he invented and is clear in this one is that off to the right, you have a horizontal and you're looking at across a, a street front. But on the left, you're looking off to the distance in a bus. Um, he right. would do that on a ferry or in a, a, in a plane or in other areas where one side was off into a vanishing point and then the other side was a straight up storefront. So interesting, if you go down to SD's works, I don't know quite what I have there. If you go to works and go to soul, uh, yeah, to the upper right, it says soul. Yeah, see what's there. I was just gonna point that out. That's the reflection. Yeah, now that's, that's something that Estes was really known for, was again, before he started looking down the aisle of a bus or a train or a plane or a boat thing, he would have the reflection on the left side. Um, and he's known for that very specifically, uh, taking storefronts and street scenes, but focusing on the reflections in the windows. Let's go down to Menil, if you can, because I think we may have the latest painting. Keep going down, a clean, that's Menil. Okay, well, that's similar to the one behind me. Go to works, and then to Let's see. Okay, on the top row, the second from the left. That is the newest painting from him. Wow. And it's hard for me to tell you when you're looking on the screen there, but there is the Vegas Casino Hotel on the left, the building that's kind of white gray. And you can look in the windows of that building and you can see beds and dressers. You Oops. can see it, it, <laughs> Sorry. No, let's hold on. No, go back to that. That you just, no, go back one to where you just were. The next one. No, the other way. Go the other. Yeah, okay. Um, on the extreme left, where the white line is going up to the, the camera shop, that's the one I was talking to you about, where in Oops. that camera shop on the lower. Sorry. In the camera shop on the lower left, you can see the cameras on the shelves in the back of the stores across the street where the taxi cab is going into the street. There is a, an art gallery and you can see the paintings on the wall in the art gallery. You are also looking across town in Manhattan. You're also looking downtown into Times Square. You're also looking up to the top of buildings. No camera that exists anywhere ever can have taken this picture. All of this information has come from hundreds of pictures. And Manil is number one beyond anything that anybody's ever seen. Um, getting back to the Las Vegas painting one minute. You go back to it. Yeah, okay, so I haven't seen that painting yet. It's coming into the gallery this week. It's about seven and a half feet across. And I can't wait to see it. But if you could blow it up enough 
which I don't know if you can, as I said, in that hotel, in that casino, you can see what's going on in the windows. Um, so that's that. Uh, let's go back and we'll go to one more artist. Uh, let's see. Oh, T. Tanner is on the left, lower left. Okay. <laughs> let's go to images or works. This is an artist that lives in Texas and he paints Texas scenes of what I call forlorn, kind of forgotten Texas towns. And he is equal to Menil in almost every way. However, each brick on the building, you get the illusion that it's there, but it's not quite the way Menil would do. But there's a different sensitivity and a different touch in the way he feels the work and in what you're looking at. And as you can see, it's a completely different feeling and, and, a, and a way of looking at things. Um, there was a movie years ago called The Last Picture Show. Um, anyway, this is something that you, you wouldn't expect anybody in the years past in the American Luminous and Hudson River School to paint, but it's saying something about history. Um, these towns still exist there, but not for very long. Um, go to go to Seoul and see if we have any more there that I can tell you. Look at the upper left on this one. Oh, okay. Scenes, hotel, and cafe. I mean, that just, it's almost like you can see the snowflakes and the gravel in the road oh. and, and, the, and the reflections in the water. Um, Anyway, it's, uh, there it is. That's one of the best. Go back to that one. Oh, Brenham is the third one from the left. Yeah, that one there. I mean, it's just, just magnificent. And the next one, if you just go to the right, click to the right picture, uh, that's a house in the snow in Texas. Uh, he did a whole series. Hanner and Menil are, uh, without a doubt, I believe, the two finest ever of the photorealists and of painters and of realism. And I doubt that what they've done, anyone can surpass. This is a painting, and it looks clearer than a photo. <laughs> it is. I mean, the, lift, the, the limbs and the branches and the twigs on the trees going all the way back in the distance, a camera could not have taken that because you get the field of focus. So there were pictures taken way back, way front, maybe 30 pictures, focusing on what's behind, focusing on what's in front. So it's right. all clear. Whereas when a camera takes it, uh, there's a field of focus. Now you're looking at a picture in the gallery of the current show. So anybody can, of course, go online and click on and see all of this at MyZoGallery.com. Do you want to speak about the uh, piano? Yeah. <laughs> as I said, I was trained as a classical pianist. Uh, I gave that up when I was 14 or 15 years old. But about 20 some odd, 25 years ago, I began representing classical pianists and then included uh, many more musicians. You can go to MyZoGallery Music at the very bottom of that oh, yes. page. At the very bottom of the page in the website, I represent. I do about forty concerts a year, and I represent about twenty-five or thirty classical musicians. And it's all pro bono, manager, agent, presenter, uh, whatever I can do for them, uh, I do. Um, when I get one of them uh, a gig to do uh, a Rachmaninoff concerto at an orchestra and they say, well, you can pay them $3,000. I say, well, let me uh, send you another couple of grand, pay them five. And apropos that, what you're looking at, hold on right there, is one of the rarest, most magnificent Steinway pianos that exists in the world. And that's in the gallery. It's a, called a Steinway Centennial. It was made in 1877, 1876 for the, for the, uh, American Centennial in Philadelphia. Uh, there were 29 of them. I'm lucky to have gotten one and restored it. 
uh, and that's in the gallery where we present oh, 10 events a year. Uh, and then I do all over. My largest and most important and most exciting event was supposed to be May 29th, two years ago. It was canceled at Lincoln Center. It will now happen October 21st this year. And what I am doing, I've been presenting all five Rachmaninoff concertos in one evening at Lincoln Center with an orchestra, uh, which I uh, am on the board of. All five Rachmaninoff concertos, last time that was done in one night was in 1958. Anyway, that's that more is amazing. Opinion. Congratulations. It's good that you were able to reschedule. Well, Lincoln Center was really good about it. I mean, I gave down the, the deposit three years ago and we kept postponing it. Uh, and they were going to do it this last December. And then they said, you know, with the COVID thing, we're still worried about what's going to happen. So we pushed it all the way off to next October. And hopefully there won't be another uh, version of Omicron. By the right, way. right. Thank you for sharing, you know, the, the music aspect, the history, your ti the timelines basically touch the surface. And I know we could talk about it for hours. You know, it could go on for all day. I think this was a good start. I learned so much just by doing some research and being able to associate who you are with the terminology, the photorealism, and just the history. And I look forward to, you know, following up and maybe catching up in the future. I'm here all the time. Anytime you want to connect, just do it. Thank you.